<laughs> well, welcome me. Hopefully everybody's doing fantastically well Thursday morning. Darren Saul here, your host of Playing With Perspective, the Suspended Animation Podcast. And I have episode 59 here today with David McNaughton, who is a chiropractor, academic and teacher. And we're going to be chatting all about understanding the mind-body relationship and empowering the community towards a more active lifestyle. So for anybody who doesn't know David, David McNaughton is the owner of DMC Health and Wellness. He is a chiropractor, academic and teacher. David's week consists of clinical practice at his Sydney clinic, researching at Macquarie University in the Department of Psychology and teaching undergraduate psychology and chiropractic students. David's clinical and research interests focus on persistent physical symptoms and their effect on psychological well-being. David work, David's work aims to understand how the mind and body interact in an effort to develop and improve available treatments for sufferers of these symptoms. So David, welcome. How are you doing this morning? Very well. Thank you very much, Darren, for having me on today. This oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure, mate. I'm always fascinated in the mind-body connection and, you know, you know, this stuff's been around for years and people have been studying this for years. But maybe yeah. before we get into that, tell us a bit about you that we don't really know from the intro. Yeah, well, uh, so chiropractor, teacher, that. I have a I have a 11-month-old Dalmatian, which oh. keeps me very busy at home. <laughs> Fantastic. So if I have to run out the door every now and then, just with her crying at the door, she wants to come in. Very so um, that, I um, love getting out, playing golf um, as much as I can. It's been pretty hard lately with everything to get out, but um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I love traveling. It's probably one of the main reasons why I uh, kind of pushed into research a little bit. There's a lot of opportunities to travel a little bit more for conferences and stuff like that, but any opportunity I get to travel, I Absolutely, yeah, me too. I love to travel as well. Yeah. But right now we're kind of traveling virtually in a way, aren't we? Yes, yes, you know, somewhat, but not forever. It won't be forever. Absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. Excellent, right? Um, now you, you're a busy guy. I mean, you're doing a lot of things at the same time. Yes. How do you juggle it yeah. all. You must be a good time manager. Uh, I, I've learned that that's an important aspect of it all. Yeah. Um, definitely, with the business, you're just going to make sure that's running, and you know, it's. I'd like to think of swings and roundabouts. So some things you know, take a little bit more time and then you've got to come back to the other ones, but try and be productive with everything. So, you know, I, I've always wanted to be, been one of those people that enjoys being busy and enjoys having things on. And um, there's a goal. There's always a goal that needs to be kind of met. And, and these are all, at the moment, it's just all the goals are kind of getting to the, the, the final part of everything. So, but yeah, it's they're busy weeks, but I wouldn't have it any other way, to be honest. Yeah, I'm the same. I mean, I, I do a few different things and I just love the variety. We were chatting just before we started how we both love the variety of doing a few different things and it just makes the week more interesting. But as you say, Definitely. there's always a common goal. There's always a strategy that we're aiming towards. And Correct. it's nice to go on that journey and see those goals yeah. be, you know, becoming fruitful at the end. Exactly. It is. Yeah. Um, and I thought, let's jump in. I mean, I can't wait to get into this content. Yeah. Um, obviously, the mind-body relationship has been an area of research for centuries, probably. Correct. How has it developed over the years and where are we now with it? Yeah, it's, you're totally right. All the way back, you know, Hippocrates type yeah. stuff. Yeah, right. um, and, you know, understanding, you know, the gut is a, a form of stress type yeah. thing. And so this, this stuff has been around for, for quite some time. Uh, We've, we've moved, especially in the last century, we've moved a lot further with things. And that's really just with our technology's gotten better, yeah. to be honest. You know, a lot of these things prior were very much theories and, 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 and hypotheses. And now we're actually able to test this sort of stuff in a manner that we've never been able to do before. Stuff from genome testing and functional MRIs. So we can actually see what's happening in the brain when people are exposed to things. Wow. And, and the, it's, more, it's more about not necessarily the structure of the brain, um, you know, we can, we can see that in dissections for a long time, but looking at the function, looking at where the connections are happening, where the changes are happening when people experience happiness, sad, pain, fatigue, that kind of stuff. Looking well. at where those changes happen in the brain. In the brain, looking at how things change in different people um, and correlating that with a whole range of things as well. So it's, it's a really exciting uh, area to be a part of, to be honest. Um, 
it's still not, you know, it's still not, you know, a research priority for a lot of things. These, these syndromes and these disorders are very much uh, just in the background, yeah. but um, definitely there's a, there's a lot of exciting opportunities coming up in this research and my PhD as well. Uh, you know, I was, it's my PhD, so I think it's awesome. So <laughs> but definitely trying to understand these connections between the body and the mind um, is really exciting. And hopefully we can target treatments better when we understand that a bit more. In other words, we'll start maybe treating the mind more than the body in a way. Uh, it'll be both, I reckon. I, you know, it'll be, I think where we're at now is it's very much a bi-directional relationship. It's right. very much, you know, one will always influence the other. Yeah. And in different circumstances, it might be reversed as well. So understanding this connection and this, this quite fluid and dynamic connection between the brain and the, or the mind and the body um, will help a lot of people really well. Fantastic. Fantastic. So tell us a bit more about what you actually specialize in, in your clinic and how you go about that with your patients. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, obviously I'm trained as a chiropractor, so I'm background as a chiropractor. Um, very, very biomechanical. Essentially, I, I would argue that a lot of my training has been in uh, looking at how the body's move, moving, the structure of the body, you know, are there any changes in the body and, and can we improve on that type of thing? Yeah. So a lot of my history and my assessment looks at just who the look at, looks at the body, essentially how they're moving and, and what's going on. Um, my other aspect with the, you know, the, the PhD in psychology is really kind of layered another element to all that where I now look at the person a little bit more as well. And, you know, you look at their life history, you look at their thoughts, their beliefs, um, how they view the world and and all of a sudden we get this kind of layered perspective of you know this is the mechanics of the body but this is actually the, the functioning or the executive functioning of the body as well and okay. and we need to kind of understand both of them yep. so that's really where I kind of start in clinic it's just kind of getting to know that person yeah. and my, my treatments I've always been a, a big fan of non-pharmacological, non-surgical approaches to care, essentially. Okay. I think there's a real big place for things like massage and acupuncture and adjustments and exercise therapy to help people's symptoms as well as just improve their well-being and, 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 and give them a better quality of life, essentially. And so my therapy is really like that. It's a mixture of all those things to try and find out with the history and assessment what's what might be best for that person and and let's get some good improvements in their life so that's that's kind of a bit of a, a nutshell of what i do in clinic i personally don't think it's special i think that's just <laughs> normal um because that's you know that's what the literature says is the best thing to do and, and that's what i found over the years that's worked the best as well and so what kind of prompted you to move into studying psychology? Was it just your yeah. interest in this area or? Yeah, I've, this was great. Uh, so I, I was at Macquarie and I did Cairo and um, I did well in the, the yeah. Cairo degree and there was an opportunity to kind of do some paid study. And yeah. I knew I wanted, Cairo sometimes gets a little bit of like a bubble sometimes, yeah. like all, like all industries, I think, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I knew I wanted to, kind of just look at things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I was always interested in mental health and very early on in clinical practice, I noticed that it was a, there was a big part of mental health yep. in people's experience of pain and, and symptoms. And I'm uh, one of those, I'm a very curious person. You have to be a curious person to get into, um, into research. Yep. Uh, and I didn't really like the answers I was getting off some of my teachers <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> or, <right>. some, or <laughs> some, of, some of my colleagues. As well. And I was yeah. like, Ah, what that can't be. really so that kind of really prompted me to kind of go out and and just kind of throw myself into deep end and i ended up ended up um, linking up with a, an amazing professor in the psychology department who's fantastic and we work we work really well together and i've got like a really good little team of you know pain scientists psychologists um, i work a lot with gastroenterologists we do some brain gut type work wow, my God. Um, and and statistics as well so it's this mixture of research methods and and, and clinical science essentially yeah, I mean, so yeah it was a, it was a uh, it was a 
interesting part. I never thought I would get into this research, let alone psychology. And yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I've, I've loved it ever since. It's been tough, but, you know, running a business and doing a PhD is, is somewhat tough, but, you know, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, I mean, I've always been fascinated by psychology and how humans interact and how they behave. And for any, you know, medical practitioner, particularly or health practitioner that works in on the physical side of things, to have an understanding of psychology as well and how the mental side of things is working behind the scenes must yeah. be incredibly powerful for you to really be able to holistically treat your patients. And that's, that's the whole idea. That's, you've kind of hit the nail on the head yeah. there. It really, as I said, I, you know, I was very trained very biomechanically and, you know, we still understood that these were present. Like we, we didn't kind of just ignore it. We knew yeah. that this stuff was there, but you know, the more I get into the theory behind why people do what they do and, you know, what are the mechanisms going on in people's brains and that connections in the body, you know, what's all holding the them back from doing things maybe, or doing even the exercises or whatever. And, you know, even that there's a, there's a, there's a lot of research just on the fear mm. of, of moving and the fear of exercise yeah, yeah. Um, after an injury. And there's a whole, whole range. And that's, this is wow. you know, psychologists been doing this for a long time. And yeah. all of a sudden I start to get these answers that I've been looking for. And, and, and it's, it's really given me a laid approach to, you know, how I, how I um, do my history and my assessment and my treatments, but also just how I you know, appreciate people's position a little bit more. And, and you can really understand that sometimes people get in a, get, get a bit stuck type yeah. thing and, and yeah, yeah. it's not, it's not necessarily their fault or anything like that. It's due to a number of things. And my job as a clinician, a lot of the time is really just to kind of guide them out of that and, and, and get them back to a better quality of life. Yeah, fantastic. So. I mean, here's a question that I've always been fascinated by and I still don't know myself. And mm. hopefully it'll be of value to the listeners and the audience as well. What is the exact difference between a physio and a chiro? You probably uh, get this all the time. <laughs> I do. I do. I still, I, I still have conversations with yep. physio friends yep. about this sort of stuff. My, my personal, my personal um, opinion on this is it's really not a lot. To, right. to be honest. Oh, I, know, I know physios that I treat very similar to. Oh, really? I know I know chiros that I treat very differently to. Okay. So it's, it's what I kind of say these days about that question is just like find a practitioner that you get along with yep. and that you get results with. Gotcha. And, you know, it doesn't really matter. The body the science of the body doesn't really change between professions. You know, we're all learning the same things. We just, we may have a different opinion here and there yeah, about yeah. how things might change. But, um, we're all looking at the same research. We're all guided by the same evidence base. Yep. Um, as I said, find someone you get along with, find someone you get results with. It doesn't really matter if that's an osteo, that's a chiro, that's a physio, it's a doctor, or it's a psychologist. It's, yep. they're gonna, you know, the right person will help you at the right we'll time. Help you. We'll help yep. you on your journey. I always thought that maybe chiros do more, you know, cracking and physios do more massaging. Is that, or is, it's really a bit of both now? Uh, you know, as I said, this is, this is where it came to. I know a lot of um, physios that do a lot of manual therapy oh, really? as well okay. and stuff. Um, and they've got a whole kind of postgraduate kind of training course on that kind of stuff. Wow. So if, if I was really going to get, I think there has been some research done on like exact differences with treatments. Yeah. Um, Cairo historically has been a bit more hands-on okay. in terms of, therapy um a bit more kind of you know integrating massage and adjustments and, and i'm i'm quite a hands-on practitioner my, my consults are you know they're half an hour essentially so okay. it's really doing quite a lot of manual tasks um whereas maybe you know, historically some physios a bit more hands-off a bit more exercise based I see. so they more physio might consult with you and then give you a series of exercises to do whereas a chiro might actually spend a bit more time working on the area Potentially, potentially, as I said, okay. it's all, it's all, but it's all but different. I, in, the end, in the end, I still do a lot of exercise rehab as well, because it's really yeah. important, you okay. know, that stuff, it's all, it's all quite important. Okay. So Fantastic. my personal cool. thing is find someone that does a little bit of everything. Um, yep. And that yep. way you're more likely to get a result, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. Makes right. perfect sense. Okay. Lovely. So mate, tell us a bit about your corporate work. Cause I understand that you do a bit of clinical corporate programs as well. What do you do actually in that? So this has been an exciting, um, um, opportunity that's really sprung out of COVID-19 to be honest yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know we're always looking for opportunities at, at times like that and um, I, I it really came off a reflection of what was going on in clinic where I right. noticed a lot of people coming in with a lot of neck and back complaints from home office setups 
And historically, over the past years, there's been a lot of investment in the workspace to kind of get people set up ergonomically, yep. um, you know, limit, you know, neck and back and uh, repetitive strain claims um, in, you know, for work cover. Yep. And uh, I feel like that just all got thrown out the window <laughs> with yep. the last, last three months. So what I've been doing and getting out there is just offering businesses and, 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 and corporates essentially um, a consulting package essentially for their employees. Yeah. Um, you can get templates just off work cover, just being like, it's like a checklist. This is what right. your setup should be. You should yeah. be doing this. You should be doing that. But what I'm offering is a bit more personalized uh, treatment for that, for that, um, for the, for the worker at the same time, getting them compliant with all their work health and safety um, measures well. because a lot of businesses might not understand that they're actually still liable for their workers, even if they're working from home. Right. So right. Yeah. You know, if they're sense. injured, if they're injured um, in that space, um, they, they really need to make sure that they're, they're kind of covered from that risk. Right. And uh, right now it's not too bad, you know, cause everyone was kind of thrown into this and the government said you can't go to work and you can't do this. Yeah. So it's still a, a green field at the moment. Yeah. But over the next month or two, we're moving into a stage where businesses are having to make a decision. And the consensus I think in the workforce is not everyone is saying, I want to go back full time mm -hmm. and not everyone is saying, I want to work from home full time. Yeah, so yeah. there's going to be this, this balance a little bit more, which was never there of, of people some days working from home and some days working in the office and for employers, that's when they become even more liable because they've actually made that choice now to allow them to work from home. So the corporate kind of consulting is really built around that, yep. um, is really built around, you know, if we want to kind of mitigate that risk for the employers, let's, you know, have a consult. It can all be done over telehealth as well. I don't need to be there. Um, over telehealth or over Zoom. Yep. Let's see how your setup is. There's still a bit of a history. We can do some quite reliable assessments on people if they have pre-existing stuff. Yep. And we can actually put together a more personalised plan for them. Okay. Um, and then review as well. So that's, that's, that's the, it's like an exciting little opportunity that I'm, that I'm actually on the yeah, ground. Right. Right. So when do you sleep? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I sleep? You've got a lot of stuff happening on your plate at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said, it's all, it's about <laughs> balance. It's a swings and roundabouts. Yeah. As I said, so sometimes things, some things take a bit more of a priority at other times. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But definitely, uh, yeah, definitely they're busy weeks. But as I said, I I enjoy a busy week. But well, I always say, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. So that's <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Now I'd that's love to cool. hear. I always ask everybody about some case studies and examples because cool. people love hearing stories, real life stories about success stories. Really. So yeah. I'm wondering if well, you have I'm any. More, yeah. More than happy to tell you all the success stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Maybe give us a few success stories of how you've really helped people. Yeah. Um, with your understanding as well of mind body connection. Definitely. So um, predominantly what I treat is, is neck and back pain. Okay. You know, that's, that's my uh, majority of my caseload is, is back pain, predominantly neck pain and headache and then yeah. shoulder pain. Yeah. still do a lot of, a lot of other things, but that's really what I see a lot of the time. So people present to me with that. They don't necessarily present with anxiety or stress or that yeah, kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But once we get into things, we notice that that's quite an important factor in why they're experiencing that at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, especially when we get into what we call persistent pain or persistent symptoms, yep. where the definition of persistent symptoms is where the tissue or the, the damaged structure, uh, you know, if it's a disc or if it's a muscle or a ligament or something, it should have healed by now. Right. So, uh -huh. you know, we're getting symptoms beyond the normal healing time. Wow. And this is, this is, this is chronic pain, essentially. Right. This, yeah, yeah. this is what people struggle with. And one in five Australians will experience chronic and persistent pain. It costs a hell of a lot of money. And it's the number one cause of global burden, uh, wow. years lost with disability. It's, it's huge, mate. You know, so, so, so the majority of chronic pain actually manifests even after the healing has is has finished. Well, that's the definition of. That's chronic the pain. definition of chronic pain. I thought you could still have chronic pain. You just have a chronic issue that keeps that's not healed. Some you can get the you know these we get into a little bit more nuances with this sort of stuff where yep. um, some have chronic diseases essentially, but I that's see. due to um, can be due to uh, chronic inflammatory disorders like um, yeah. Uh, 
uh, ankylosing arthritis and, yep. and there's a number of these kind of more genetic disorders which you know the immune system and the, the body's kind of attacking itself a little bit yep. but we also get pain which is it should have healed you know people yes. have an accident and or they just have a, a minor trauma and it, it and it should have healed in about three days. Fascinating. Okay, months. interesting. I never knew that. Uh, and that's this is really my research perspective as well. I look at what we call functional or unexplained symptoms, right. where yeah, where, yeah. where con contemporary medicine can't really describe an organic cause for this yeah. sort of stuff. And it's very common, this sort of thing. Wow. So when we, and usually this is when the mind-body relationship becomes even more important. This is, this is where it really, really, we start to tackle things. So there's a number of cases where I've had patients come in with back pain and, you know, it's, it's been from what you would consider. Um, there's been pre, there's been existing surgeries on the back. So the mechanics have changed, yep. you know, there's um, might be some metabolic stuff. So she, um, she was actually a little bit obese and a bit overweight, which, you know, obviously puts strain and inflammatory yep. changes in the body. Yep. Um, but also what was going on, she had an incredible amount of stress in her life, <laughs> like in terms of work stress and uh, a social network stress. And she just wasn't coping with that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so my job really in this was to kind of one, make it apparent that like, this is an issue and, you know, symptoms potentially won't just go away until we address this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's when in many cases we can, if we need, we can get you know, external help from the GP or a psychologist as well to, to kind of target some of those areas that are not, you know, pain linked yep. or they're not pain specific. Whereas I can talk about when she says, you know, I'm, it's really getting me down type thing. You know, this is depression and pain go hand in hand and, you know, explaining to her that that's okay. Like it's completely reasonable yeah. to, to feel it's like that. A normal response. The normal response and you know you don't have to you know you don't have to avoid that feeling um so this is a really kind of we're getting to this understanding of your thoughts and your feelings around the pain itself and once we can change some of that sort of stuff we can actually change the symptoms there's a lot of research on that and a lot of good research just about if you change your thought patterns and you change your thinking around pain you can reduce your pain and we do we see that quite often in it's the basis for psychological therapy. Right. So, it's, so it's really, it's, it's pain, but it's psychosomatic in a way. Correct. It's brought on Correct. by our mind. Not brought on. I think it's more, it's more uh, related and, okay. inter and related with. So a lot of the time I try to have we, have, we have, we have pain and symptoms. And on top of it, we have distress okay. that goes with it. And what we try to do with therapy is we try to kind of tease those two things apart because in the beginning, it's the same. It's all the same. I'm, I'm distressed because I have pain. Yeah. Well, yeah, I understand. But let's, let's tease these things apart. There's some things we can do for the, the actual symptoms and the, the actual, you know, cause of the pain. And there's some things we can do for the, the distress associated. Okay. okay. You know, and that's, that's okay. really how I, I try and work with, with people and a number of cases we, you know, I can do it with them. Um, sometimes we need to refer out for more help because yep. the distress might be from their relationship or with their partner or yeah. they're at work or, you know, some longstanding family issues. And, and you know, that's really not my, I, I'm, you know, I'm the first to one say when, when something's outside my scope. Yeah. So that's, that's a really, really good way, but that still needs to be addressed with people. Gotcha. And, and you can at least inform you know, them that that should be addressed and that will help them in other areas. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, there's a number of cases where we reduce stress in one, one aspect of someone's life and there's other improvements in their other parts of their life. And people experience that quite a lot of the time. Amazing. Um, but yeah, when, when there's pain, it, it, it just becomes a little bit more confusing and, yeah. and people lose a lot of research to show that people lose the ability to problem solve and problem solving is a, a really important, um, evolutionary aspect of us being humans That's <laughs> to right. try and move forward or move past issues essentially. But, you know, and we can see stuff in the brain where pain actually takes up more space and there's, you know, there's a lot more connections with emotions. So it's difficult to actually get to the cause yeah. of issues. If you're, you, you're very emotionally reactive to things. That's right. And I suppose the, the more pain you experience, the more tangled up you get in your emotions. And then it's hard for someone like you to start removing and unbundling and for right. making sense of what's what exactly and that's that's exactly right especially yeah. as it goes on for longer as well yeah it's, it's it's all just falls into one big mess yeah 
that comes into a thing of neuroplasticity and, and an aspect of learning as well. So when you experience pain for so long, the body gets good at experiencing pain and will actually change. The nervous system will kind of adapt or change um, to a way that allows you to experience more pain. It's, you know, I talk about um, the way we can cope is can be adaptive, but it also can be maladaptive. Yep. Um, and the way the body can cope with, physical symptoms can be adaptive, but it also can be maladaptive. Yeah. And it's really about picking up where things are getting unstuck and then kind of gearing them on the right path a bit more. Wow. That, that's just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, cool. <laughs> absolutely fascinating. Um, and if people want to um, get in touch with you to actually um, yeah. work with you or to even you know, work with you on some research, what are some of the best ways yeah. for them to do it? Mate, um, e- email is always good. I'm, I'm, I'm always on my computer. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> David at dmchealth.com.au. Um, my website is up dmchealth.com.au, um, and also my social media. You know, Dave the Cairo, even Facebook, um, DMC Health and Wellness. Always looking and exciting to work with people with research as well. We've got a great team at Macquarie, which do some really, really awesome stuff. And I've just started this um, international kind of collaboration with a bunch of um, chiropractic researchers from all oh, around the world, and um, we've got a lot of really good. We're actually trying to get together some multinational projects and, and really do some good stuff, essentially. So a lot of exciting opportunities in the next next six to 12 months. And it's hopefully I'm not too busy to drop the ball on anyone. So. Outstanding. And I'm looking forward to seeing how your evolution continues and your research continues into the mind-body relationship. Yeah, when will your thesis or your PhD be finished? Uh, well, I was meant to finish the end of this year or beginning in early next year. Yeah. And I think um, I had one more project that I needed to do. It was an experimental project, um, which unfortunately was uh, incorporates face-to-face testing. Oh, so nice. I've had to put all that on hold with everything for now. But hopefully, you know, if everything everything keeps going outside with COVID-19 and we get case numbers down, potentially next semester I'll be able to, um, or August, I should be able to start testing a bit more. So it should only push me back another six months or so. But well and truly at the tail end of things and starting to really collate all the papers and the projects and, and, and submit essentially very soon. Oh, it needs to be done. It's been a, it's been a large proportion of my life. This. Yeah, well, man, I'm sure you'll be really looking forward to when that started. I wish you the best of yeah. luck with that as well, mate. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Excellent. And now last thing, I mean, I really appreciate you coming on the show and mm-hmm. I've learned a hell of a lot, even just in terms of simplifying where we might need to um, help ourselves address certain things because, you know, when you simplify and understand what's happening, you can start making better decisions as to how to treat them. So that's been really fascinating to me. Um, And I always like to ask the, you know, the guests to leave our viewers and our audience with one or two tips that they might be able to implement away might just be how they perceive things, how they think about things might be how they actually treat certain things. So what's on your mind at the moment and what, what do you think can help people? I'm always, you know, I'm always one for a good, good broad general health advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, exercise, stay social, talk to your family and friends, yep. um, uh, eat a well-balanced diet, you yep. know, and if you need help, seek help type thing. You right. know, I, I, to start with, you know, keep things very, as you know, as you said, keep things very simple. And, <laughs> and just doing those things like getting a good night's sleep will have profound effects on your health and your well-being. Um, for more tailored and specific stuff, go, you know, and, and I'm not saying, and a lot of people do need help, you know, I'm for one, I need help sometimes, and so having I. more professional advice to kind of guide you through that stuff is to be uh, what I call a catalyst for change. So it just kind of kind of gets you going a little bit more, kickstart nice. things. Fantastic. Very good advice. And I'm, I also love the advice you gave earlier, which was, you know, just find someone that you can trust and yeah. someone that you get along with and you feel comfortable with and start the process there that that might not be the end they might be able to refer you to other people but at least start with someone that you trust and you feel comfortable with and that will help you on that journey yeah it really if you're starting at that there's you you can't really go much wrong from there excellent well david thank you so much for joining me this morning it's been an absolutely fascinating chat and for the audience i'm going to leave all the links in the show in the show notes for how you can contact david for his various Uh, busy activities and schedule and uh, mate i wish you all the very best and everything and thanks for coming on the show and for the audience out there um thank you so much for listening 
um, another great episode and we'll be back very, very soon. So thanks again, David.